Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University, and welcome to Outrider 9, Citation Politics. Oh, this is exciting. So this is the beginning of a trilogy, a trilogy that comes via request from Joanne. We'll get to Joanne in one minute. But this trilogy starts off with you and you making decisions about who you cite and why. But we don't let you sit in that subjectivity. Then in the next Outrider, we move to the role of citations in academic disciplines. And we finish off, of course, with the most important discussion about citations, the role of citations and references for your examiners. So this is going to be an incredibly exciting trilogy. And all of this started with Joanne and Heidegger. Let me explain. Quote, I would love a conversation about qualitative research around the history, politics and ethics of using hermeneutics. I've been struggling with all of this due to Heidegger's Nazi affiliations and how he repositioned culture to be an enabler for racially based eugenics. End of quote. Thank you, Joanne. Now, this is a topical area, okay? There's no clean or crisp or easy arguments to make here. But I know that you are a brilliant person. So what I'm going to do today, and in fact in this entire trilogy, is present the arguments to you for your consideration. And I want you to make a determination for yourself, something that you personally and professionally can live in, but further is also contextualised by your academic disciplines while always remembering why you are doing this PhD, and that is it is being assessed by examiners. So whatever we may personally or professionally think, it's what the examiners think that is the most important discussion to be had here. But this is a trilogy. So... The question we're asking, and it's a big one, is does the behavior of a scholar, like an affiliation with Nazism, impact on how we engage with their research? So this is big. This is asking us to think through and think about the relationship between a researcher and their research. Yeah. What do we do with Nazism? What do we do with a professional history of sexual abuse and violence. And how do we understand, say, it comes out that an academic bullied or was gaslighting colleagues? What do we do with that information when we attempt to understand their research? Think the Manhattan Project, the remarkable scholars who did incredible research and then saw how that research was used. Or one of my great heroes, the legendary Alan Turing, who was an incredibly inspiring human being, but one of my former colleagues endlessly used to describe as, quote unquote, a traitor. Now, that seems relatively historically inaccurate to me, considering he sort of broke the Enigma Code. But see, that's citation politics. And I've been living with and living through this for the last 30 years. Who do we cite? And why do we cite them? These are big issues. So let me start with a crucial story that was pivotal to the configuration of my last book, 12 Rules for Academic Life. And this book had a good focus look at Jordan Peterson. Now, I've been watching Jordan Peterson's arguments and videos and reading his work since 2016. Early on, 2016, 17, 18, 19, I made a decision not to reference and not to cite his work because I didn't want to add citations to his records. So this is sort of a version of Joanne and Heidegger, but Peterson, trust me, is no Heidegger. But one of my dearest friends on the planet, Naslan Birmani, took me on when I started to make these comments, like, oh, I just can't cite him, Naslan, that's important that I don't do that. And Naslan 
as she always does, offered me great advice. And she asked me to think through an argument. And I'm going to share that argument with you today. And I hope you do get to meet Naslin through this series. She's the Research Support and Special Collections Librarian at the University College London Institute of Education. So she looks after the remarkable students in the Centre for Doctoral Studies at IOE. It's a wonderful place. I've had the privilege of speaking there. And Naslin's one of my dearest friends. So I hope I'll be able to bring her into this series at some point. But Naslin quoted me back to me. Always a challenge. And I'd stated somewhere that, quote, I didn't want to give heat and light to that which is dark, disturbing and wrong. End of quote. Now, Joanne, that's your argument too, right? And Naslin took me on, so I'm going to present this argument for you and your consideration. She wanted me to work a lot harder than simply denying the use of references. She wanted me to think about how we as researchers use research when something goes wrong. Now, that research may be unethical. It might be flawed. It might be a bit dodgy, but what are we going to do about that? And she sent me a fantastic article titled, quote, What to do with a predator in your bibliography, end of quote. We're going to return to that article shortly. It is transformative. But I'm using Naslin's provocation to me to offer a provocation to you, that all of us work a little bit harder that we don't live in denial and refusal and simply ignore ideas that make us uncomfortable. I ask that all of us, and I'm including myself in this, all of us do a bit better as a researcher. So what I'm going to do is work through five of the most difficult research case studies that I can think about that ask that great question, to cite or not to cite. That is the question. So, Joanne, let's do this. I've called this citation politics, this outrider. I define politics as a struggle over meaning. So I'm not telling you what to think at all, you brilliant people. I'm presenting arguments for your consideration, a struggle over meaning. And the issues that we're going to be talking about are important to your research life today are incredibly important to your PhD, but also your life beyond it. So let's look at five really tough issues and test ourselves. Let's go to the first one. And that is fraudulent research that is highly cited. This is a simple one. It should be a very simple beginning. But sadly, even our simple beginning is a bit complicated. And it's not as easy as it may appear. And yes, we're going straight into Andrew Wakefield. Now, you may not quite know that name, but when I add two words to the name Andrew Wakefield, vaccines and autism, all will become clear. So in 1998, Andrew Wakefield published an article in The Lancet that claimed to The Lancet, that claimed a link between autism and vaccines. Now, that paper has since been retracted, but it is one of the most highly cited retracted papers in academic history. Okay. Now, the wonderful Elizabeth Sluzer, a librarian from the Medicine College in Wisconsin, investigated with five of her colleagues, this is great research, what's happened to the citations of this paper. So almost investigated an information history of this paper, what happened since it was published. What a brilliant project. And they explored if the paper was cited and if it was then cited negatively or positively. And they also explored how researchers presented the retracted status of this research. And the retracted status is going to become really important shortly. Okay, early citations emerged when the article was first published, 1998 Lancet, when researchers just sort of located the flaws in the research design and noticed that this was not a repeatable set of research ideas. Okay, then of course the retraction happened and the citations then started to move into the role of this article in creating questioning about the efficacy of vaccines. Now, at that point, most citations were negative, which, 
which is good, which is a blessing. But what's significant is most of these negative citations did not mention the retracted status. The librarians in their study, therefore, recognised and affirmed and expressed the importance for all of us that when we are citing a retracted article, that we mention, we speak, we write that it has been retracted. We write that in the text of our article, but we also present it in the reference list in the bibliography. And these great librarian researchers argue that while researchers may know the flaws of this study, students and colleagues from other disciplines, you know, and let alone non-specialists from the public, might see this high level of citation and make a more cursory judgment about the quality of the piece. And therefore, they recommend strongly to all of us as researchers that we make our findings available and understandable by a diversity of readers. So whilst the overwhelming majority of citations of the Wakefield article are now negative, they continue to be recorded in Google Scholar, in Scopus and Web of Science. And the nature of our time is even negative citations ensure that this particular article continues to move on up in a database. Therefore, we need really clear statements now about the retraction of articles and books and book chapters and research. Now, the AMA re uh, referencing system does allow retracted status to be part of the citation modality, and that's brilliant. But it is currently the only research mode that allows us to do that if we follow the style guide. So therefore, this is our first issue with regard to citation politics. The article gets through refereeing, and then it's wrong. It's fraudulent. It's deeply problematic. So what do you do then? It's retracted, but it's still cited. And I agree with Sulzler et al, by the way, that we need to continue to cite that research to show that it is wrong, that is important, but we must mention the word retracted. We must have that always attached to this research. Okay, well let's now move to the second and even more troubling issue that really started my whole conversation off with Naslin. And this was an article that was published, and Naslin sent this to me, this article was published on September 15, 2020, with the pretty powerful title, quote, what do you do with a predator in your bibliography? End of quote. What a great title. So the author confirmed that they had cited Gary Urton in an article. And many of you can probably understand the story of this researcher, right? This researcher went through incredible lengths to create this research, had gone through referees, reader one, reader two, made the corrections, done all this sort of stuff, and finally got to publication. Wow, what a feeling that is for those sort of articles. But then at the point that the, this particular researcher was doing the proofs, the publicity started to emerge that Gary Urton was accused of using his position in Harvard University's anthropology department to enact sexual favours from colleagues and students. So that news broke as this person was about to get this article published. In response, the author stated, quote, I quite simply didn't want to cite this guy anymore. Who wants to cite an alleged predator? Who wants to accelerate the research of a possible creep? <laughs> End of quote. Love the use of the word creep. I don't use the word creep enough. That's going to be my new resolution for the rest of this year. But can I say the challenge is that editorial guidelines are silent on these sorts of issues. So what do you do, colleagues, if you've worked incredibly hard on a research area, worked hard to produce the article, gone through all the refereeing, and at the point that you're about to publish this thing, something bad is released about one of the researchers that you cite. Could happen to every single one of us. And this is a really difficult citation territory because citations live in this binarized academic space. They're cited or they're not cited. It's a binary opposition. But in this case, this particular author did something absolutely <laughs> 
absolutely amazing, so inspirational. What they did was they placed an asterisk in front of Urton's name every time it appeared in the article. So whenever his name existed, there was sort of a little asterisk going, and the asterisk led to a note at the end of the article that presented the alleged cases of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Great. This was brilliant. This was a great strategy. Sadly, it's a strategy that Elsevier did not allow. And that final note was removed. But good attempt. Good attempt. So this is a powerful story. And we all have to work out how we feel about this as academic predators start to be revealed. And of course, this is not just a sexual matter, as Joanne has realised in this query that started this whole trilogy off for me. Because all of this is really about us thinking about the relationship between the research and the researcher, right? This is tough. And we have to ask the questions about the ethics of academic writing and the separation that exists between a person and their work. Heidegger, Nazism. So how do we manage personal disgust in response to a researcher? And how does that change what we do with their research? And of course, it's all right to talk about us, but as we'll talk about in the Outrider next week, I'm much more interested in how journal editorial policies and how particular disciplines and academic gatekeepers handle these sorts of issues, yeah? So let's move to issue three. My maxim of life, to be frank, put the problem into the work. Put the problem into the work. Joanne was exploring for herself and asking me to think about it with others if Heidegger should simply be parked intellectually because of his links to Nazism. The political allegiances of this particular academic were so disturbing, so horrific, has the time come to simply not cite them anymore. Now, that's a, an ongoing argument, and I will always respect your call, so that is Joanne's decision. But let me present an alternative way of handling this matter. And we're going to talk about the consequences of these decisions in your career and through your PhD. But there is an alternative. And let me express that from the two scholars that I found incredibly problematic through my career. And they are, of course, Aldazer and Foucault. Aldazer has been the intellectual constant of my adult life. I read Aldazer when I was a, an impossibly young honour student. I know the old crone that you're seeing before, was I ever young? Yes, I was once. I was. And uh, during my honours year, I read Aldazer and it changed my life. I was never the same again after I read Aldazer. And to this day, I read Aldazer as, a, as an intellectual sorbet that cleanses my mind. And I engage with all the scholars that have also been influenced by Aldazer. But the problem with Aldazer, and it is a catastrophic problem, is that he strangled, he killed his wife with a tea towel. And then proceeded to spend the last component of his life in a mental institution. Okay, so let's put the problem into the work and let's start to use a life tragedy such as this to talk about the complexity of intellectual life. So I use this tragedy at the end of his life as a lens, as a filter to understand his research. It also allows us to talk about mental health and mental sickness in academic life. It also allows us to talk about academic marriages and what happens in them as we discussed in our last Outrider. So these are positive and provocative questions to ask. Now I still use Althusser. I cite Althusser, I read Althusser, but there's always now additional contexts around my deployment of that research. Okay, now Michel Foucault is even more complicated for me and I probably have had through my life a very similar relationship to Joanne and Heidegger when I'm dealing with Foucault and I, I probably have been where you are now Joanne and I'll tell you how I've got out of it. 
And look, I firstly acknowledge the incredible intellectual work that Archaeology of Knowledge, Discipline and Punish, they're probably the books of the 20th century, remarkable scholar, remarkable scholarship. But then the guy that, you know, sort of summoned the phrase death of the author that then Bath went on to take and became fixated, you know, so had critiqued subjectivity, then in the latter stages of his life became obsessed by subjectivity and obsessed by identity politics through his history of sexuality. So it became clear that this mode of identity politics summoned by Foucault was incredibly selfish politics. And all of this sort of stuff was being justified. It was just horrific. So many of us of my generation, Generation X, just quietly sort of stopped using Foucault wasn't really useful anymore just feels really a bit rubbish to use him right so it's like because we look at the end of it we go well look that's just rubbish and how does that impact on the earlier very interesting work now these sort of quiet decisions that were made by generation x academics like myself those sort of quiet decisions were intensified by a remarkable book that was published in 2015 and this book was called, I've heavily cited this, Foucault and Neoliberalism. And it was edited by Daniel Zamora and Michael Berant. Incredible book, inspiring book. And after you've read that collection of chapters, we can never really cite Foucault again without a huge footnote that has to state the impact of his arguments on the rise of identity politics, and further, then the profound problems that emerge between the alt-right and identity politics. And so much of the tragedy that's happened in the last 20 years, you know, the decline of attention to public education, public health, on we go, has been created by that scrag fight between the alt-right and identity politics. So basically every time I use Foucault, I reference that really important and powerful edited collection. But then things get even more interesting, colleagues, because then, wow, Mitchell Dean and Daniel Zamora published a book with Verso in 2021. It was titled, what a title too, The Last Man Takes LSD, Foucault and the End of the Revolution. I hope I live long enough to write a title that's anywhere near as fabulous as that one. So Mitchell and Daniel take this last chapter of Foucault's intellectual life and ask two questions of us. What happened and what changed? Great. Now they showed the impact of what they describe as the California Foucault on his ideas. Brilliant. And what they did was they focused on what happened after Foucault dropped acid in Death Valley in 1975? Can you just imagine? So you, you drop a tab of acid in Death Valley. Okay, so that's what Foucault did. Okay, so this incredible book that explores, you know, starting with Death Valley and then looking at what occurred. This incredible book is the best book I've read this year by a very wide margin. It is brilliant. And they took the problem, the consequences of Foucault's neoliberalism, and they explained it. They demonstrated how it happened and the consequences of it. Brilliant. So instead of simply erasing or parking the work of a scholar because it makes us all feel a bit uncomfortable, they put the problem into the work and demonstrated clearly why it occurred and the impact of that event on identity politics and how we think about intellectual culture. And as you can see, the problems can create outstanding research. And so, Joanne, that might be a model for you. So issue four is, who are you citing? Who are you citing? There is a power to citations because they confirm with intellectual generosity the great scholarship that existed before us. And that intellectual generosity is displayed through our citations. Now, Sarah Ahmed has made really strong interventions since about 2015 to show the value of citations 
in summoning, in her case particularly, a feminist memory, a feminist intellectual history. But here comes the challenge, and this is the fascinating one. When I was a younger scholar, I always remember being in a seminar, so I was about 20, I think, and I was in a seminar, and oh, I thought a pretty good seminar, it was a pretty good seminar, and then the question time happened, and a woman got up pretty aggressively and said, you haven't cited any women in this presentation. Why haven't you cited any women in this presentation? And it's like silence, silence through the seminar. Now at the time, and you might think the same, and a lot of me still thinks the same, to be honest, but at the time I thought, is that a relevant question? You know, do, does a vagina impact on the quality of research, right? Um, is the calibre of the research determined something about the identity of the researcher, right? And I found that very uncomfortable. I still sort of do, to be honest. So if you're of that same ilk where it's like, well, you know, it's about the research, dude. It's not about the researcher. If you're of that ilk, I get that. I understand that. And, of course, that's Joanne's problem as well. The researcher has an impact on her engagement with the research. So there's that argument. Let me make the argument a different way for you, for your consideration. If your researchers, the researchers that you use, are all white men from Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Canada, the United States and Europe, then have you been completist in your research? Let's go into this. So I'm absolutely certain they are outstanding researchers. That's not in question. Absolutely outstanding researchers. But that citation risk list does raise an issue for your consideration. The next question is, do you believe that the greatest minds in intellectual history have been white men from Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Canada, the United States and Europe. Now if you do, your citation list verifies your argument about greatness and scholarship. Okay, no problem. But the challenge with that citation list is that you've made a decision to ignore the overwhelming majority of the world's population. Okay. So therefore you don't know if you've been expansive in your study. Remember, you've got to prove a significant original contribution to knowledge. And if you've been patchy in your research, if you've focused on a particular sociological grouping and you haven't been completist, then people have got to ask the question, are you sure it's an original contribution to knowledge? You sure? Let me tell you a story that may help you. The, the book that I'm best known for is called The University of Google. And when the referee reports came back on that book, there was one bit of the referee report, and they were great reports, I mean, it was just, I was weeping, but one great bit of the report from a, a wonderful scholar said that he was inspired and a bit frightened by what he read in this book, because not only didn't he recognise most of the researchers' names, not only did he not recognise the names of the researchers that I cited, he didn't even recognise the journals that I cited. So... I attempt to and always have through my career to bring new voices and new ideas and new journals into these debates. So ask yourself, and you know, no judgment on it, just ask yourself, what nations are the bulk of your citations derived from? So what nations, go through your list, look at the nationality of your researchers, where does most of your research come from? And just ask yourself why, why that happens. Are there any women there? Ask yourself the question. Women, yeah, no. Are there scholars of colour in your list? And are there new voices and new journals that are cited as part of your research? So what I'd ask is how about all of us make a decision to find those new scholars and cite them? Find those new journals and cite them. Because citations can be the font of resistance. Citations can challenge our boundaries, our parameters, our very understanding of what is knowledge.
So if we continue to cite the same authors and cite the same journals and verify what the gatekeepers are doing to intellectual culture, then we continue to draw on a very narrow range of backgrounds and experiences and expertise. And of course, this is the politics of citation. Women are cited on average much less than men. And my favorite bit of that story is if women co-author with men, their citations increase less. So what we are choosing to cite tells a lot about us as a researcher, tells us a lot about your research. Therefore, we need to really, maybe you don't have to change at all, but all I ask is that you are aware of your intentions when you come into a research environment. Your citation list is a proxy, and perhaps an inelegant one, of your information literacy, of your research ability, and it also is a proxy for your courage in seeking out alternative voices and views. So if you continue to cite the same names from the same journals, are you being completest in your research and can you prove a significant original contribution to knowledge? Fifth one, fifth issue and we're done. Ponder how publishing, research, and our universities conflate political and market values. <laughs> oh, yeah. When addressing these issues, I really want to recommend an article that, again, changed my life, changed my view on the world the moment I finished reading it. And this article was Carrie Mott and Daniel Cockenay's 2017 article, and it was titled, quote, citations matter, end of quote. Thinking about citations allows us to ponder the ongoing systems, policies and procedures that are the punctuation of our intellectual life. And for me, this is often about monitoring and calling out the behaviour of gatekeepers in our academic disciplines that continue to underrepresent and marginalise particular groups and particular subjects, particular theories and particular disciplines. Now, one way to address these gatekeepers and answer back is by talking about citation politics. Think about citation cartels. These are the informal agreements between communities of scholars that they continue to cite each other. In the old days, it used to be called lab courtesy. Mm -hmm. Now, Mott and Cockney explained, quote, our shared feeling of discomfort, frustration and anger at the conduct of certain fellow scholars at academic conferences, in publication processes, and in the context of departmental politics. End of quote. So Mock and Cockney are early career researchers, just out of doctoral programs, untenured, no security. Courageous. Courageous. So how do you learn from their example? How do you manage, negotiate, and transform their politics of citation to break up those citation cartels? Now, the problem we have in international higher education in our universities is that citation is handled as a relatively straightforward performance metric <laughs> that's used for appointment processes, used for promotion. But we need to recognise there are profound limitations on journal citations that are incorporated into those metrics. And we only have to, and we're going to do a lot of work on this next week, by the way, you only have to look at the differences in the citation modes of Scopus and Google Scholar to see the consequences of those differences on academic life, on research, but also on academics. So I know this has been a provocative Outrider. I've done that with intent to really unsettle you a bit, to present arguments, not that you agree with me, I don't want you to agree with me, but I do want you to think through the arguments rather than assume the arguments. 
And we have to thank Joanne for getting us into this really complicated space. And, you know, please disagree with just about everything I've said here. That's good. Disagreement is productive. Because what I'm talking about today is the exact opposite of cancel culture, the exact opposite of no platform culture. What I'm affirming is the importance of academic expertise and focusing absolutely on the freedom of expression, but also that there are responsibilities through that expression. It's also a recognition, I think, of the limitations of commercial academic publishers and the consequences of those commercial academic publishers in being the gatekeepers of our academic disciplines. So Citation Politics asks all of us to wake up, come on, who are you reading? Why are you reading them? Who are you citing? Why are you citing them? And are there blind spots? Are there groups or communities or nations that for some reason you sort of haven't cited? And ask yourself, why? There are many reasons why we cite. And when we cite, we not only demonstrate the understanding of our discipline, but we foreshadow where we believe our disciplines will go. But we also cite to serve our readers. We show repeatability, we show the accountability of our research, and citations ensure that we arch beyond ourselves. Citations matter because we all need to read widely. We need to include people that we disagree with. We need to include the retractions. We need to note the errors. And what we do through citations is that we build knowledge with honesty, with integrity, and with courage. So next week, we're going to enter the outrider that I described as Mandalorian citations. We're going to look at the Jedi citations, the Siths, Sith citations, and then explore how this is the way through citations for our academic disciplines. And Joanne, I thank you so much for this provocation. You are a truly wonderful and inspirational scholar, and I wish you all love, light, and peace. Tea out.